why is consistency important? Why is consistency in code important? And I'm going to answer this by asking you how many of you are working in projects with more people? Just raise your hand. So everyone is, everyone is paying attention because almost everyone raised their hand. Usually, that, if not everyone raises their hand, it means they didn't listen what I'm saying. So, because nowadays everyone is working in teams with uh, more people. And in that situation, we are very often in the position of reading and uh, modifying other people's code. And when I do that, I usually get this face. Or sometimes, not usually, sometimes I get this face. Like, really be surprised of the code that I'm seeing in my project. It's, it's that weird situation when we have all sit at the same table and decided that we are going to use Entity Framework to do the data access. And then after a few weeks, I see code something like this. Some string, state, uh, string which is uh, com uh, composing on a SQL statement and then just directly goes to the database. And that's, that's weird. Of course, there were reasons why that happened, deadlines and so on. But um, there are other variations that you usually might get into, into the code when we are talking in this example about data access. For instance, yes, we are using Entity Framework, but we can see here that there is a sort of implementation for the um, repository pattern. On the other hand, in other places of the same project, there is the Entity Framework context being used naked, so directly without just ignoring the repository implementation. And all this variation may create problems. Uh, and usually the problems are, in general, that you're getting towards a lower maintainability. Uh, usually you might get into a polar separation of concerns. And by time when uh, code grows, in an ecosystem manner, things become just more difficult to understand and maybe to predict what, what's going to be the effect of certain changes that you're willing to do or have to do to your code. So what we want from our projects in general, especially if we are talking about large applications, we want to have similar ways of doing the same, or, or for solving the same problem. Like a, a common way of doing data access, a common way of doing dependency injection, a common way of doing error handling. If possible, a common way for everything related to communication. So you can really understand when you're looking at that code okay, this is how this application is being built. You should see some patterns in there, and some order put in place. Another situation which may arise from this diversity or lack of consistency is that you don't really know which path to follow, especially when you're ending up in a, in a, in a project like a new developer to, to some project which was there for a, for a while. And this happened to me, one of the first projects that I was doing, I entered this project which had SQL, SQL Server as a database, and at the same time it had a NoSQL database. So there's, there was always, there's already the opportunity to have some um, interesting ways of doing data access. But this wasn't actually the problem. There were many ways of doing data access and I couldn't really figure out, um, when I had to implement my tasks, I couldn't figure out which path to follow. So I was going and asking my colleagues, okay, how should I build this screen? And I was getting different answers and without a real clear reason why those differences are there. So I said after a few weeks, okay, I'm going to implement now a new way of doing data access. I'm going to come up with the repository implementation. And from now on, everyone should hopefully use my way of doing data access. Started to work on that. And after a few days, I realized that this was a bit too late because it was simply way too difficult to make all the code that was already in the project to do a new way, of, to have a new way of doing data. So this lack of consistency created quite a few problems, especially when a new guy was entering into the project. And I was added to the project because the project was already behind schedule. So it wasn't a nice situation anyhow. Um, this means that consistency has a very tight connection with the cost of change. Meaning that if we have consistency in the way we are writing our code, um, changes should be cheaper. Even if we are having the wrong approach for doing data access, as long as that mistake is consistently repeated, 
it means we will be able to refactor it with one solution, with one strategy. On the other hand, if we don't have this and we have like a million mistakes, each of the mistake is being done in its own unique way, then you're going to have like a million ways of fixing all those small problems. So consistency helps a lot in decreasing the, scope, the cost of change. And I like to use this sign when I'm talking about quality of code because in general, good code also leads towards better uh, efficiency of that project, better uh, some cost reductions if we are looking to a large project that span over years. Now another reason that um, consistency is really important is because it links to this thing. We know for a few years that when projects fail for technical reasons, those technical reasons are often uncontrolled complexity. So this means that we have allowed our project to grow as a code base in a manner which we no longer understand or we no longer can control. And that's becoming difficult to handle. And basically our code starts to look like this. And what we wanted is to look it like this. I would like that when I'm looking to my code base to be able to see patterns on how things are being done. And patterns, I don't mean a uh, gang of four design patterns necessarily. I mean common way of doing things. If I look to, an, to a, a list screen, I should see clearly see how things are being done there, how the data is being retrieved, how the projection of the database is being done, how the filtering happens, and so on. And by the same, I should more or less see the same patterns on the, on the other screens that are implementing more or less the same functionality. So it's important to have these patterns because if we do, then it means that even if the project is large and complex, our area of concern when we are going to change something is going to be limited. We can understand better which are going to be the efforts of the changes that we are going to make. And we can come with solutions to refactoring problems and so on. So it's really good to be, to be, to be in this place. Now, because we know for a while that managing complexity is really important and we want to not to be here, we come up along the years with architectures which when we sit at the table and we think how we should do this project, we come up with these areas of concern like most of the times we have the data access layer, on top of it the business logic layer, on top of it the presentation layer, and then uh, we have this idea of how we will separate things we come up with some diagrams which express those ideas and then we start uh, to come with more rules on how dependencies among our modules will be created or among our classes can be created. Then we come up with things like clean architecture and uh, dependency rule and so on. And then we start coding. And after we start coding, things are no longer that easy or that clear about the separation of concerns. And most of the time, the reason is that quick and dirty often wins over the only way to go fast is to go well. Do you know who has said this or made it famous? The only way to go fast is to go well? Uncle Bob, uh, Robert C. Martin, he has a few famous books which all start with clean, clean code, clean architecture, cleaner programmer, if I'm not mistaken. So um, he's, he's the one who's a promoter of this um, craftsmanship movement. And he likes to um, say that we as developers should do a good job because we are good professionals and so on. That's, that's good, but often it's not enough because when we are on tight schedule and you really need to develop one functionality each day, one screen per day, it's very often that you're going to say, well, I'm going to do it quick and dirty now, and uh, we'll see later. And by the time grows, things are going to become more and more difficult. Um, for instance, um, I'm going to tell you a story when I was more or less in this area. Like, um, we are, we were, I was working a few years ago for a large company that was doing a, a software for the Dutch market, and we were basically a services, development services provider. And we got this new project in, quite complex in, uh, in an insurance field. So the essential complexity was, was high. It's not easy to make an insurance uh, system. 
So I estimated in a few days with a few colleagues and we more or less concluded that in, let's say, the best case, we are going to end up this project like in a few years, three years. We, said. we went to management and said, I think, uh, I think we can do this in like three years. And management said, well, uh, we sold it for one year, so we, we will deliver it in one, uh, one year. But no worries, we are going to um, uh, hire a few more people. We are going to take other seniors from other teams. So we are going to create three teams like yours. And with three teams, three years, you are going to make it in one year. Of course, we had those discussions like, uh, you know that two women cannot give birth in four for five months. We also explained that even if you go by car from Sofia to Cluj with two cars, it's still going to take you 12 hours. But somehow we understood that, yes, we need to start working on this project as fast as possible. And this is the situation. Let's work on it at least. Uh, um, try to have some minimum level of quality in there that can sustain the size and the complexity of the project. We didn't want quality because Uncle Bob said it's a nice thing to have. We wanted quality because we knew that if we have like three teams, let's say five, six people in each team writing code at a fast speed, if you don't have some consistency in the way the code gets written, we are not going to have three years to work on it because we are going to quit the job and go to another company. So we wanted some minimum level of quality in there to be able to work on this code base. And we said, okay, we are going to have the architecture explained to everybody. And the three of us, we are like the team leads or the seniors or whatever, we are going to review everybody's code and make sure that the critical aspects are being obeyed. So we are just going to review the code. And we started to assure this quality through discipline. And we measured the quality through what the fuck's per minute. Um, well, this kind of work in the beginning, until which, uh, until when um, the seniors were just overwhelmed. These were the guys that were reviewing code. Like, if, you, if you're having like four other colleagues that are writing code eight hours a day, and you're the only one doing the reviews, for the critical aspects, of course, that's a lot of code to review. Then the other thing was that we were the ones having some of the most complex tasks in the project. So in the morning was like um, opening the email and explaining everyone, everyone from the management side why the project is a bit late. Then uh, it was code reviewing. In the afternoon, it was explaining to everybody how we should refactor things and how to get things done. And late at night, it was working on your own tasks. And during the weekend, making the release because we were the only ones understanding how the, all the components uh, link together and how we can deploy this in a distributed environment so people can test it. So it was quite quite difficult. And if you have this quality only through discipline, it won't scale. At a certain point, these seniors will realize that life is too short and they are just going to do something else. So we try to do something else quality to structure. And this is, in fact, that is the point of my entire talk, like how you can achieve quality to structure. Like building that structure that I was telling in the beginning, which makes it easy to do right things, easy to write the code which follows the design, but then at the same time makes it difficult to write that code. So we wanted quality not only through discipline, but through this structure. And there are a few techniques to which you can get there. I start with the last one, which is a simple thing. Use dependency injection and use it only through the constructor. This will generate some of the some benefits in your code, like programming on against interfaces, like depending only on interfaces, like not allowing circular dependencies because you're only using constructor dependency injection. Then another idea was inspired from clean architecture, like do not depend on frameworks, make the frameworks depend on you. So you um, assure a consistency on how those framework, frameworks are going to be used in your code. That was also something that we did, and I'm going to insist on it, on it a bit later. And then was use assemblies, um, or packages if you're in Java, to enforce some separation of concerns. And Assemblies have really clear boundaries, and you can really see uh, how references are being done among the assemblies. So you can use them 
to have some rules on which assembly can reference what assembly and if you see some references which you wouldn't expect, it's also easy to, to notice that you reduce. There are even automated tools which can point it out. So this is what we want to achieve, some quality through, through structure. And as I was saying, this comes, some of the techniques come from Agrabo. I'm a big fan, by the way, I like uh, his books. And he published a while ago, 2012, this article, uh, this article called The Clean Architecture. And he said, your application should not depend on frameworks. The other way around, it should be. Your application is the most important part from your system, that's your code. Don't make it depend on things which you're not in control when they change. And that seemed weird. I mean, how come I cannot depend on the entity frame? I mean, I'm using entity framework, I will call it. But he said, you know, I published a few articles in the 80s, 70s called Solid, and there is the dependency inversion principle in there. You could use dependency inversion principle to invert the flow of control. Like, the, the dependency rule says in the clean architecture, you can only depend from an outer circle towards the in, inner one. In the inner circles here, you have uh, your application use, uh, use case code. Here is your functionality being implemented. The use case is the entities that's the most valuable. At the other end, you have the, you have the frameworks. You should have dependency only from the frameworks towards your code. This translated over here, it's just a zoom over this. I would have, for instance, a controller. This one receives an event from the user, like the user says, place an order. Okay, to implement that code into my controller, it's easy. I can just call a service from my use cases layer. Uh, let's say ordering service. I call the function place order. That's dependency which I made from the green layer towards the red one here. And that's an allowed dependency because I'm calling a class from an inner circle. Then my use case implements that logic. What's about uh, how can I uh, place an order? And then my use case should say to the presenter, if I follow the flow of control, show some data to the user. Tell to the user that the order has been placed or tell him that he will receive his, uh, the things that he has ordered. So I should say to the presenter, I should call a function from the presenter. Now, if I do that, it means I make a references, a reference dependency the other way around. So from the inner circle, I want to have a dependency towards an outer one, which is not allowed. And after both says, well, that's not that big of a problem. You can invert it using the dependency inversion principle. And that means you create here an interface, an abstraction. You abstract the framework. You're just going to define in that interface what's, which are the needs from your use case from the presenter. And that, that interface is now part of your application. It won't change because the framework changes. It will change only because your needs from a presenter change. And the presenter will just implement that interface. So the dependency is being worked. So this is the main, the main idea. And how does this look if we take the story towards the components? And basically, this is the main technique that I'm going to, that I'm usually using to implement this clean architecture and to achieve that consistency. I would be tempted to have an application component. So these are the DLLs which implement my business logic. I would be tempted to have them directly reference the external library. This is a simple example for logging. So I would use log for net to do the logging. Usually, I will make this depend directly on, on it. Now, as I was saying, I don't want, I want to invert this. So I want to change this. So what I would do, following the clean architecture principles, I'm going to define here an interface which expresses the needs my application has for logging. This interface only changes if my needs change. It won't change because the external library changes. And then I will, of course, implement um, the interface by wrapping the external framework. And by doing this, I'm achieving not only the fact that I'm not depending on the framework, so I follow some article, but the way my application is going to use the external library now is going to be consistent. It's going to be only here. If something changes in the way I want logging to be implemented, it's going to be here. And the interface, this one, only changes if my use case changes, if my um, application changes. So now if I realize that I'm using the external library in the wrong way, this is only one place where I need to do changes. So 
I'm having one place where to change, it's more in my control. Now for logging, this maybe is not so interesting. Oh, by the way, this might seem that I will end up with too many assemblies, so I could do a quick, um, let's say a small compromise. So I take this iLogger interface and I place it into the assembly, which is part from, of my infrastructure, but only this interface is being public and the implementation of it, I make it as an internal class. So I make sure that my application components are not able to create a uh, dependency on the implementation class. They will get implementation of this, of this interface, only through dependency injection. And that's it. And basically my application components do not, are not allowed to have other references to the external library. So this is one simple rule of how references can be created. I can take that for any external library that I have. So create that uh, assembly which contains the abstraction, implementation, and that's it. Now this gets really interesting, interesting if I go to data access. And this, basically, if I use this technique, I can now enforce a separation of concerns between uh, data access and business logic. So what do, I, do we have here? We have the business logic component. This is where my application code, the most important thing, gets written. I don't allow these guys to have a direct reference to entity framework or hybrid or whatever you're using. This means that over here on the top layers, I don't, I'm not able to write data access concerns. I cannot say they are new entity framework context. I cannot open a connection to the database because all of those are not available to me. I would need to make a reference which I won't allow. So the only way to get data is through some interface which I control now. It's not a framework which decides which are the needs of my application from the, for the data access, it's me. So I can create here, I usually like to implement this with two interfaces. I have one I repository and one I unit of work. These are the only public uh, interfaces from this class and the implementations are internal. So you can only get that uh, through dependency injection or through factories, depending on how I want to constrain things to be written in my code. So one thing to remember here, the business logic component is not allowed to reference data access, and this makes the data access concern not to leak above the above layers. So I did, let's say, half of the loop. I don't have business logic leaking out, but I also want the other half of the loop, like not having business logic written in here into the data access implementation. And to achieve that, I would like to have the data model, and these are the classes which Entity Framework maps to the tables from a database, so I usually generate those from the, some foundations from the database. So I don't want this to be in the same assembly with a Entity Framework, with the data access implementation, actually. By default, of course, they go there, but I can change the how code gets generated so I can separate these guys. And the reason I don't want them here is because if I, would, if I don't have them here, I cannot write business logic in here. I cannot say if person dot age below 18, do not serve alcohol. And I really, really hate this business code, so don't want it in here. I also don't want the reference from the data access to the data model, because that would allow the same thing. I also don't want the reference from the data model to the entity framework, because I don't want data access concerns in here. I don't want on a getter for some property on some uh, strange condition to decide that it's time to go to the database and fetch more data. That's, that's, not a good, that's not a good design. So I don't want a reference from here to entity framework or to the data access to mix the concerns. This is what I would like to achieve. Uh, by the way, this says that you can find the exact implementation of this data access component on GitHub under the GitHub uh, iPark account. It's production ready code, a bit old because it's with uh, F uh, framework six, but you can really see how it works and how it's implemented. It's also available on GitHub. Oh, sorry, on Mugiat. Uh, so you can really see how this is actually being written in code, not on in some slides. But if you uh, are a bit familiar with entity framework, you realize that this picture is maybe not that easy to implement, meaning that somewhere you need to write um, somewhere you need to write some code like, let me go to it. 
like this. So this guy needs to, to sit somewhere. And um, the place that it's going to sit in cannot, uh, usually is here into the data model. But um, if I would put it here, then I can have this is logic in the data model. So I don't want that. And what I do instead is I will make an abstraction. Again, I'm going to create a sort of dependency injection inversion. So this is the reference that by writing this code, the class which inherits the delete context and says which are my entities. I don't want them here, so I am going to, um, I, I don't want this reference, so I'm going to invert it. And to do that, I'm going to create another abstraction in my data access implementation. And that abstraction is going to be implemented by a, uh, another uh, by another assembly. So I have the abstraction is called DB context factory. Basically, this interface only has a function create context, which we have here an implementation which is really trivial, saying like new search entities. And basically, this assembly will only contain these two classes, like the implementation for the context factory and the entities by themselves. Now. I already, I, with this, I implemented what I wanted. I don't have references from the data model to entity framework. I don't have um, references from the data access to data model. So I have that separation of concerns being enforced. Um, I might have another need, like implementing some business logic just before something saves or just uh, before something gets deleted or something like. Uh, fix some data after you have read it from the database. And that kind of logic should also be triggered, triggered from the data access. You don't want business logic here, so you don't want that code written into data access assembly. So you can, again, use the dependency inversion principle. And that's why we have the identity interceptor interface here. This defines some simple methods, on load, on save, on delete. The implementation of this are in my business logic component. Using dependency injection, all, thing, all the things get wired up together. And then when a sales order is being saved, you, can, you will be triggered. Uh, the onsave method will be called by the repository implementation. And the, this code actually will live in my business logic component. So I can, using dependency inversion, I can really play with um, all dependencies get, get together. Now let's go a bit back. To, to this point. So um, I want to emphasize a bit on how the repository entity framework, uh, how the entity framework repository is being implemented. So this is a code snippet from the class which is in here. And you can notice that I marked it as internal. This means no one can say new entity framework repository. And it actually means that if you want to have the data access from here, you need to get this through dependency injection. And over here, I have an annotation which instructs my uh, component that does the dependency injection registrations that this class is an implementation for this. So this is a way to, to put some constraints in, uh, in the way of code will be used. Then uh, if we look to these two interfaces, we can see I have the repository, which only has one function, get entities. This means that if you get a repository, you can only read the data. The iota fork inherits the repository and adds the other functions that you might need when dealing with data access, like save changes, add, delete, transactions, if you really want to, want to play with those. So now, because I am defining the data access interface, I have the opportunity to put some um, separations or, uh, or to, to play with the interfaces. So I create patterns in the way my business logic code is going to be, uh, to be, to be uh, written. For instance, all of my classes that do uh, only read data, like this is a uh, get action from a controller in a web application, we have received the repository through dependency injection. That's the only way to get the repository. Um, we say repository get entities for the sales of the header, add a filter, select some data, return the data. If you want to read data in order to modify it, then you're going to use, or you're going to need, in fact, a unit of work. Only here you have the save changes. 
and I like them to be um, to encourage somehow the developers that when they will use a unit of work to add um, a using statement. If you have noticed, the unit of work inherits the disposable, so it favors that construct with a using. So I like to have this code, this kind of code written in my higher level code. So place the unit of work in a using. Um, do the save changes at the end. Have a really narrowed scope for um, for the unit of work. The repository being lighter, it can live, let's say, a bit longer. And this kind of um, separation that I that I put in the interfaces that do the data access also open this door for some optimization. So you can see in the entity framework implementation, I have this thing saying. You shouldn't keep track for the entities that you're returning and, and telling to the entity framework that these are going to be only read on. Uh, and another thing to notice is that the, entity f uh, the unit of work implementation class is a private sealed class into the entity framework repository. So the only way you can say new on it is with this method. So again, I'm enforcing the way you can get a reference of the unit of work. Okay, so basically what we are achieving through these interfaces is we are having patterns on the how data is being read, we have patterns on how data is being written, so we have all these patterns in our upper, upper level code, and these are supported by a structure to, see, to achieve consistency. Now this was about um, data access. So, we go to, to this. Basically, we have achieved this implementation. This is what we've seen with the dependency inversion with the DB context provider. I mixed up a bit the order of the slides, that's why I went back and forth. So we have this uh, implementation for the data access. Now, everything to work as I was talking, we need some, some another, another brick if you want. Uh, I said a lot that you cannot get um, implementations for the I repository unless you're using the constructed dependency injection. I also said that we want to enforce to have one constructed dependency injection. So we need some support into the dependency injection uh, implementation. And that support, I usually add it through this component that I like to call application boot because it deals with starting up the application. So basically this one implements the principle which says that you should always separate the configuration and construction from use. And this, this one deals with configuration and construction. So it wires up the dependencies, so dependency injection can construct objects, and it can also deal with configuring your application, like which is the database and stuff like that. Uh, most of my applica uh, application components will use the application boot. And the application boot has this service attribute, which is used to specify um, registrations that should be done into the defense injection. So application boot doesn't do nothing special than uh, we've seen so far, meaning that, yes, it will provide defense injection support to the application components, and it will be doing, uh, doing it, applying the same technique like I am going to hide the dependency injection framework, the external framework. In this picture, I use Unity dependency injection container, and I don't want any of my application components to have the right reference state. They can only know about the application boot, which hides it. And the application boot defines this abstraction, the service attribute, which you can use to decorate a class by saying, okay, the class that I'm decorating is an implementation of this interface. And it should be, uh, it should have this lifetime. I also have, to, uh, I also like to have the lifetime of a registration dependency injection very close to the class, because if I would say this has a lifetime like an application scope or a singleton, and I have some state, so it's a stateful class, and I'm in a concrete application, maybe I should think about synchronizing the the multi-threading access in there. So it's uh, it's good to think about the lifetime when you're reading the implementation of the class. And it's also good to uh, separate how you do the registrations in the dependency injection 
from the rest of the replication code. So this declarative way somehow uh, helps a lot in this area. Now what we are achieving with this is, uh, besides this, is that we are hiding the dependency injection framework. So it means that we are again in control of how dependency injection is going to be done in this project. Only construct a dependency injection because that opens uh, or provides better support or towards better written code. By doing this, this is how most of my classes which implement business logic will look like. So we have dependencies only towards abstractions because we can decide what gets re registered into the defense ingestion container. We won't allow anything else to be, to be there. So you can only say uh, uh, get, uh, get type or get implementation or get instance you can only say it for types which are interfaces. You can actually check this in code. You can do that check in debug only, if you don't want to have that reflection check at each object uh, being instantiated, but you can do it. Then, only use constructed dependency injection. This means that visit the, all the dependencies my classes have will be visible, <laughs> so I can really be critical about those classes which have more than four to five dependencies, Maybe I should think about their cohesion, maybe I should split them, and that's again leading me towards a loosely coupled design. Um, and of course, this also helps with unit testing. So I can easily test now a class which looks like this. And these benefits come from the dependency injection. Now, as I said, I only want constructor dependency injection, which helps into preventing the circular dependencies. This is an example of a circular dependency. Like this class, the approval service needs a price calculator, and the implementation for the price calculator needs an approval service. It's easy to spot this if it's just two classes in the dependency chain, but if you would have like 10 classes in the dependency chain, it's a bit more trickier to, to spot the circular dependency. And circular dependencies among your classes will lead towards a couple design, will lead towards a poor prediction of the changes that you're going to make. So it's good to avoid them. And if you just use only constructed dependency injection, this will crash when you're, uh, when you're running it because it's going to be an infinite loop. It also favors some design patterns in your code, like chain of responsibility. I have here an example of how you would implement an approval service. This one receives an array of other approval service implementations, and you might have an approval which only uses, uh, let's say, the history of the current customer. So I only want, I want, don't want to receive new orders from the customers which don't pay me, for example, that's a good idea. And I also want to have another approval step which is based by the price. So if this client um, makes an order which is maybe too low or maybe too big, I don't want to approve it. And now, because I'm having the support from the application board, meaning that I can have this implementation registered with a label, and then when someone asks for a, an array of implementations into the dependency injection, all of this will be uh, passed over here, then it's much easier to promote this kind of code in my, in my, application, um, in my application components, rather than having one implementation which has not here in the approve function like if, else, if, else, if, else, that's uglier, that's less, that's harder to maintain, harder to test, that's not something that we, we appreciate. Now the client of this approval service, because it receives here, or it asks as uh, a dependency, one approval service, it won't need to know that this is implemented as a composite, it will just get it. So it's transparent for, for, for the colors. So again, we are creating patterns in the way dependencies are being done in our project and we are doing it with some support from a structure to create and to achieve consistency. So to sum up, these are the two components which I usually use to start an application infrastructure with. By application infrastructure, I mean that structure that I rely to create some uh, minimum level of quality in my code. And I use the application boot and data access. They are both available on GitHub and as NuGet packages. I want from the application boot support on how dependencies in service composition. From the data access, I want enforcement of separation of concerns, data access, and business logic being enforced 
as a separation patterns on how I read data and how I write data, and the interceptors for this is logical. This is what I achieved from these two small elements. Um, you can, of course, find more resources about this as part of my training. Um, I have a four-day training which basically goes deep, deep into this, and also part of it on GitHub. If you go here, you will find samples on how these two components can be used and integrated in your code. So it's just demo code, but it's really hard for to go a bit deeper if you want on, this, on these ideas. If you have questions. That's not easy because you already have this level of inconsistency and you're dealing in a way with a legacy system. Um, one way to do that, in general when we're dealing with a legacy system, you're changing it because you have to. You're not changing it because you want to make it clean. You're changing it because something changes with business logic or in legislation or whatever. So you really want to focus your changes on the areas which change more often. And the idea is, I am going to identify the class or the function which needs to be changed. I will try to write some tests on that, however I can. Some uh, black magic frameworks can help me in here. So just write some tests that will assure that the changes that I'm going to do um, at least are going to have the effect that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm expecting. And I'm going to follow the call of that class into another area of my project where things should be clear. Cleaner, sorry. And then by the time I'm moving more parts from the legacy systems into the cleaner part of the project, I'm going to move those parts from the legacy system, which change more often, into a cleaner part. Once I'm done with this refactoring, I should delete those black magic uh, unit tests or integration tests or whatever, because they've done their purpose, like they are sure that my refactoring didn't affect much. Other questions? Sometimes getting this question, this question um, how, how do I deal with the situation when I don't really have the time to, to build this application infrastructure, when management doesn't give me time to do it? And um, what I learned along the years is that um, we developers and managers are always on the same project, on the same team. We just don't speak the same language sometimes. So what I usually try to do is to go and explain in uh, their language why consistency and why code quality matters. And uh, usually it's good to use words like cost and profit. It's also, uh, it's also good to uh, have some graphics like this one. This one shows um, like the normal path of evolution for a project. Like in the beginning, we are going to deliver f features and functionality at a slower rate because this is the time when we are investing in design and infrastructure and so on. We are learning about the technologies that we are going to use. And then we are going to reach at this phase where our speed of delivering new features is more or less constant. No matter how much code we have, we are still able to deliver functionality at more or less the same speed because we have a design that will help us to do that. If the project has an end, then we are of course going to slow down because it's getting, get, it's getting ready. What we usually somehow think is that we can do it like this, like from the start, assume that we, not only that we have the infrastructure and design in place, but we somehow think that we have done this project once, one time before. So we already know everything that there is to know about the project. And of course that's not true and we are going to go on this path. So we are going to deliver functionality at a higher rate because we don't invest in design, infrastructure, architecture. We are going to deliver faster at the beginning but our productivity uh, drops. It's never on a, um, or at least for a short period of time uh, on uh, uh, increasing and then it starts to drop until we are going to have close to zero productivity before the project is ready. 
So a graph like this and words like productivity, uh, cost and profit um, make things, re things really clear for someone who really pays for your salary. And that's, uh, that's a good strategy that it worked in my case. If you have other questions, So the question is if Spring Boot or Spring Data Access has more or less the same functionality and use like uh, use the for this purpose. Um, I think so. I think that this kind of frameworks, I'm not that familiar with Spring and Spring. I never use them, I read about them. Um, but I think that this kind of application frameworks like Spring Kids and like uh, other many others are, they are they are application frameworks, but they are meant to um, be able to be used in any kind of application, not your specific one. So what I would do even there is leverage all the support it gives, but try, if possible, to isolate it from my code to achieve that level of consistency on how things are being done. If maybe it's not going to be that strict that I should do it if I'm just using an ORAM, that's like I explained here, but you should try to isolate from, from, the, from the framework as much as possible. And Depends in version principle, it's, it's the key, also in there. Other questions? Okay, then um, I stick around. If you have questions which you don't want to address publicly, you can find me at the beginning.